two girls are seen being manhandled by five grown-up men. The first girl calls out to Rita, who is her maid, and is also being held back by one of the men. They tear out the first girl's clothes, and Rita asks the men if they realize what will happen. But before she can complete what she was saying, the man holding her grabs her head and hits it to the ground. He tells her to worry about herself. Four men pounce on the little miss while one holds her back to watch what is going on. They open up her thighs, making her keep screaming that they stop. A knight suddenly appears at the scene and cuts down all of the men in a flash. The name of this man is Ark. Ark finds himself in another world and is beginning to freak out. He calms himself down and looks at the gear he's currently wearing. It's one he recognizes that has light and fire element resistance. A totally OP set of armor. The Holy Armor of Bellinus. The Twilight Cloak has darkness, resistance and provides mana regeneration. The Holy Shield of Two Tates and the blade that strikes as fast and bright as the lightning it's bathed in, the Holy Thunder Sword, Khaled Bolg. This is Ark's character from the game. Ark remembers falling asleep the previous day while playing a game. He wonders if it's a dream, but the sensation of holding the sword seems too real for that. Ark is covered in metal armor, but he doesn't seem to notice the weight. He turns towards the bush and decides to test out the sword. He uses his Wyvern Slash skill. The Wyvern Slash is a powerful skill that can cut down multiple trees in just one swipe. Ark tests out his fire too, and it works. He wonders if he's inside of the game, but it seems too realistic for that. While he fell asleep the previous night, his primary job was Holy Knight, with a sub-job as a priest, which means he shouldn't be able to use a mage's fire at all. Ark wonders if he'll be able to use all the skills from the upgrade path to Holy Knight, which in that case means he's super strong. He plans to put the other skills to the test as a normal gamer should, but his stomach says otherwise. He uses magic to try to open a gate that would move him to the nearest town, but instead, he falls from the top of the mountain. He remembers, while he's climbing up the mountain, that the gate is a magic for teleporting to towns the user has already been to, which is the reason for the failure this time. He remembers another skill that should be handy for getting around, which is the Dimension Move. This skill is just like a short-range line of sight teleportation spell. Ard gets to the stream and tries to drink water, but as soon as he opens up his mask, and looks into the water. His reflection is that of a skeleton. He wonders if he picked up the skeleton avatar and knows he cannot show up in town looking like that. At Louvierte Castle Town, news about another huge basilisk flies around and the people hope they do not run into it. Ark walks downtown and one of the store owners sees his outfit as an impressive one. Ark needs to get something to pay with first before he can buy anything to calm his stomach. While he's walking down the alley, he overhears a man and woman talking. The man says he couldn't turn up despite the woman paying him double his usual rates for the investigation. He says he carried out the investigation but it wasn't a payment up on success kind of job. Ark sees that the lady is an elf and yells out that it's fantastic. He tries to go after her but as soon as he comes out of the alley, he doesn't see her again. Ark notices the emblem of the mercenary guild at the top of a building. This is a place where you could accept quests and get paid. Ark walks in and he's told that he needs a mercenary license to accept the quests on the board but from his look, He's a knight that has already got fine employment. Ark tells the man that circumstances have led him to need a license, and the man tells him that, for him to get a license, there's a trial that requires him to hunt any of beasts, monsters, or bandits, and come up with proof. As Ark goes looking for who to defeat for him to get his license, he's faced with an orc that attacks him first. He takes down the orc with just one strike with his sword. This is the first monster he has slain. On his way back after defeating the monster, he meets bandits who attack knights and a lady with her maid. He stays up and watches the whole situation unfold, until after they tear down the lady's clothes and almost take advantage of her before he jumps in to kill the bandits. Four of the bandits try running away, but he uses Wyvern Slash to attack them and kill them also. He walks back to them and asks them if everything is alright. Rita thanks him for saving them. Rita introduces the other lady as Lauren Larea du Louvierte of the Louvierte family. Rita asks Arki if he's a knight in the service of some lord given his appearance. He tells them to clothe themselves for now and they can speak later. He goes on to clean up the bandits. He uses his magic flame 
to burn down the bodies of the bandits. While Lauren and Rita were looking away, Ark began to loot the bandits' supplies on their horses. After Lauren and Rita finished dressing, they came out and thanked Ark for aiding them in their time of need, and Ark replied that he was grateful that none of them were injured. Rita tells him that they'll be returning to the Louviette house and invites him to come along with them. He rides on the horses of the bandits while the girls ride their carriage. Lauren continues to smile at Ark. Ark returns to the mercenary guild with the requirements for a license. They do not expect him to bring the requirements before the day runs out, but he proves them wrong. They check the corpse and remind him that he forgot to take the runestone off the orc, and they hand it over to him alongside his mercenary license. The runestones can be made into magic items and weapons. Ark is told to check the board if he's looking for work as nothing too remarkable gets posted there, but if he wants to take on bigger jobs, he'll need to join a mercenary guild. Ark decides to celebrate this, so he orders for food to be brought to his room. At the end of the day, Ark fully realizes that he is currently in another world, and he has plenty of skills to try and more fantasy stuff for him to encounter. Every morning, Marka's mom heads to the field as the sun comes up. She helps in picking medicinal herbs. Their mom works hard for Belinda and her. Ark's first job is to be guarding someone collecting medicinal herbs. He gets to the village and is directed towards Siona's place, which is just beyond the plaza. He gets to the residence, and inside, and knocks on the door. Helena and her elder sister are eating when they hear a knock on the door. Marka leaves her food to open the door and she's shocked when she sees the knight at the door. He tells her that he has come to accept the job he was posted to. Marka allows him into the house and serves him tea. She asks him if he wants to accept her job. He tells her that he does and he has a bit of interest in picking herbs. Regarding the specifics of the job, Marka asks him if it's alright if they head out right away and he tells her it's not a problem. She's happy and she tells him to let her get ready. On their way to where they'll pick herbs, Ark asks Marka if the job is a matter of urgency as the job mentioned how fanged boars have been appearing around the village necessitating protection. He says he's curious as to the reason for her haste, and she tells him that her mother will be coming home soon, and if she knew about this, she'll be against it, so she asks him not to tell her about it. Marka's dad died the previous year, leaving her mother to raise them by herself since then. Her father's job was picking herbs, so Marka always thought it would help if she could do it for her mother instead because she wanted to make her happy. They're quite deep into the woods and Marka calls Ark's attention to a herb called Kokora. She says it helps with cuts and scrapes and is good for the skin. Kokora can also be burnt to keep bugs away. Ark compliments Marka that she's quite knowledgeable and she says that her father taught her all kinds of things and if they go a little further, they'll be able to see a kabumi tree. As she tries to go further, Ark notices a movement in the bushes and calls her back. As he goes for it, he meets a flying squirrel that looks hurt. He picks up the squirrel and uses healing magic on it. When Marka sees what just happened, she's happy that Ark can use healing spells, and she tells him that he's just like a priest. The squirrel is happy, and it begins to run around. Marka brings up the possibility of the squirrel wanting to follow Ark, and she tells him to give it a name. At first, he suggests freed tofu and tempura as the name, but the squirrel doesn't seem to like that name. Since the squirrel has its tail fluffy like a dandelion or tan popo, the next name Ark would suggest is a mixture of both, and it's called Ponta. The squirrel seems to agree to Ponta as its name, sealing the name points for it. One of the villagers comes back looking scared of the monsters. They ask him what's wrong, as the monsters are supposed to be just fanged boars, but he says they weren't. As a hunter with many years of experience, he says he hasn't seen anything like it, and advises them that it's better they avoid the forest immediately. Mrs. Sayona comes back and one of the elders in the village asks her if she sent Marka some kind of errand. Sayona says she didn't, and she expects Marka to be at home watching the house. He tells her that there are supposed to be big monsters in the woods, and he sees Marka leaving the village in the morning with a fancy looking knight. Marka and Ark find the Kabumi tree, and surrounding it is a perilous down downward slope, one which Marka jumps down with ease. The Kabumi tree is currently in full bloom, and its leaves are all white. As Marka walks towards the Kabumi tree, a huge monster appears in front of her. The tongue of the monster is so long that it catches birds flying in the air easily. The monster uses a poison fog to attack them, but Ark can take both he and Marka away from the attack. The monster is a giant basilisk that spits poison fog, has paralyzing claws, and can petrify. It is a monster with a whole arsenal of status effect skills, and a player in one of the mid-tier classes would have been in trouble. 
The basilisk continues to attack Ark and he keeps on blocking the attack. He tries attacking with its tongue, but Ark continues to teleport away, evading its attack in the process. Ark is confident in dealing with it as long as he's cautious and notices the movement of the monster. With its movement, if the game is anything to go by, it is bad. The monster uses a skill that causes everything within its range to be immediately turned to stone, forcing Ark to use the Holy Shield of Two Tates to save himself and Marka from the attack. Ark blocks some attacks and uses a combat skill belonging to the top tier class Sacred Knight, which is the judgment to bring out a large sword from the ground that can pierce through the six-legged basilisk, killing it in the process. Marka tells him that what he has just done now is so amazing that it'll have the entire village rejoicing. He asks her to keep the specifics of the creature's death a secret, and she agrees after he insists. A ring is noticed on the leg of the basilisk, and as soon as Ark walks close to it, the ring disappears. Ark feels that the fanged boars that have been showing up near the village may have been chased by this basilisk. Ark spots a fanged boar and kills it so he can take it back to the village. He takes the runestone and the fangs and asks them to tan the hide for Marka, while the meat should be shared among the villagers. Sayona runs towards Marka and hugs her with tears in her eyes. She says she's very grateful and asks Marka why she went into the woods as she was told not to leave the village. Marka hands over the herbs she gathered to her mom. Ark comes in and apologizes to Sayona. He says it was careless of him to take Marka into the woods without consulting her. He asks Sayona not to scold her because he has never met a child like Marka who cares more for her mother. Sayona smiles and thanks Ark. Different knights are fighting another basilisk in the woods with some of them already turned to stone. They're using bows and arrows to attack and they successfully killed it. The casualty report has 15 dead and 38 injured in it, which is worse than expected even for dealing with an 8 meter basilisk. The other news is that there's another that appears to have been slain with a single blow. For someone to defeat this by himself, he or she has to be a divine being or the devil himself. The elf from the alley walks through the woods with the thought of becoming stronger than anyone else. The pact between humans and elves is a little more than a farce at this point. Humans continue to expand into the lands of the elves, and in a world filled with deceit and injustice, there is no one to offer the elves any salvation. This is why she is determined to be a warrior as a daughter of their leader and for the sake of her oppressed kindreds. But her encounter with the silver warrior marks a new direction for her destiny. Ark goes after some bandits inside a tunnel until they get to a dead end where he deals with the group of bandits. Ark has gotten used to running casual quests to cover his daily expenses. After taking care of the bandits, he notices the war chest of the bandits and knows that they are in all manner of villainy. He also noticed two empty cages that were already open it down. Ark tells Ponta to let them take what's for taking and head home. Kelska reports about the attempt to assassinate the daughter of Lord Louviert, Lorraine, which failed. Lord of Diento, Triton du Diento, asks Celska how they were unable to kill the little girl. Celska tells him that they were able to kill all of her escorts but a passing solitary mercenary wiped them out. Tyron du Diento asks about the beasts from the Eastern Empire that they sent to the Louvierte lands. Celska tells him that according to their contact from the East, the creatures were still in their experimental phase resulting in the two basilisks not working well together. This caused the two of them to be individually slain. Chelska asks why Prince Dakaris is targeting the Louviete in the first place, and Tyron Dudiento tells him that it may be a request from His Highness's backers in the Eastern Empire. He goes on to say that if the lands in the north were under the Prince's control, the East would be able to focus completely on their invasion of the West. Chelska says it is true that the Louvierte has the backing of the Western Empire's Prince sect, meaning they can't afford to have their allegiance to Prince Dakares come to light. Tyron tells him to see about securing their product as they need to be sent to the market soon. He tells Kelska not to do anything that would catch the ears of Princess Yuriana. Ark walks out of the tunnel and is about to head back to town to have himself a feast of dinner when he gets attacked by the elf. While they're fighting, Ark can glance through her face and he remembers that she is the elf he saw earlier. She tells him to return the children he has taken and he tells her that he doesn't know what she's saying as there might be a misunderstanding somewhere. The fight stops when Ponta comes out. The elf recognizes her as Ventu Vulpis. She wonders why a spirit creature would be with a mere bandit. Ponta is a cottontail fox spirit creature. Spirit creatures are usually known to be cautious and rarely take a liking to elves. The elf tells Ark that it seems he's not the liar she took him for 
door, and she apologizes for attacking him suddenly. He asks her for what brings her here, and he tells her that he has been attacking bandits lately. She tells him that she heard that the bandits who operate around their area had been hunting elves. He tells her that there are no elves captured in the cave. Unfortunately, elves fetch a high price in the slave markets, which is the reason why they are being hunted. Ark gets back home and has and has another feast. He wonders how he'll get to the elf again as she barely even tells him her name. The next day, Ark uses his dimension move to the woods where he suspects the elf forest to be. He comes across an elf being hunted down by some bandits. The elves are loaded into the cart, and Ark sits afar watching the whole occurrence unfold. Although the elf told Ark to stay out of Elva's issues, he can't just sit back and look, but before he acts, the elf that attacked him earlier already jumps out to attack the bandits. The bandits tell Mr. Udolan that she's a dark elf, which is a rare find that would fetch a high price. Udolan tells them to do whatever they like as he's not interested in feisty women. She takes down the bandits and as Ark is watching from inside the bush, he can see that she's strong. Udolan tells her not to move while he uses the children as a shield, threatening the death of the children if she makes any move. The other bandits come closer to her and they begin to examine her body while she's helpless. She hears the voice of Ark telling her that he may have promised not to interfere before, but he's here to help. He uses dimension move to appear behind Mr. Udolan and hits him with his armor lariat attack giving her the chance to finish the remaining bandits. The younger elves are happy to see her, and Ark goes on to break the padlock, setting the elves free. He tells them that he's a friend and they do not have a reason to be scared. The children elves have mana eater collars around their necks. This keeps them from using their spirit magic, and this is the reason why the elves couldn't escape. Ark uses Uncurse magic to take the Mana Eater collar off and uses healing magic to heal the injuries. The elf is surprised at what had just happened, and she knows Ark is not an ordinary knight. She whistles and calls a Whispering Fowl, which is a type of spirit creature that can remember speech and deliver messages. She uses it to send a message that four children have been rescued and calls for someone to come recover them. It's hard for any human to tame a spirit creature, so whispering fowls is used as a way of communication among elves. The help arrives and the children go with them. The elf introduces herself as Ariane Glenis Maple to Ark. She's an elf warrior and tells Ark that he has her gratitude for what he has done. The whispering fowl comes back and tells Ariane that they've made their headquarters in the village of Diento, and she is requested to come at once for them to rescue the others. Earlier, Ark introduced himself as a mercenary to her and now she asks if she can hire him right now. Although some of the other elves wouldn't be pleased with this development, Ariane wouldn't risk it if Ark was any other human, but since he shows no prejudice against elves, saved the children, and is even accepted by the spirit creature, she decides to trust him and ask for his help in saving her people. Ark accepts the deal to be her mercenary. Ark uses his gate to transport himself and Ariane to the top of the mountain in front of the Lidel River. Diento is no longer far from where they currently are. At Diento, Ark and Ariane meet with a colleague of hers called Danka. She introduces Ark to Danka as a mercenary who will be helping them. To prevent commotion on the street, they move somewhere else. They move to a bar and Ark refuses to eat because there's no way he plans on taking off his helmet. Ariane introduces Danka as Danka Niel Maple to Ark. Danka is an elf warrior like Ariane and has been gathering information. Ariane and Danka are not siblings. Instead, they come from the same city of Maple within the Great Canada Forest, which is the reason for Maple being in both of their names. Ariane introduces Ark to Danka as a mercenary who came to her aid when she was fighting elf hunters in the forest so she hired him to help them with the rescue. She tells Danka that Ark is no ordinary mercenary and he can use teleportation magic. She also introduces Ponta, who is Ark's companion, and with this, Danka can approve of Ark. Danka has been able to locate its base of operations and it's situated near the entertainment district. It is a place where they can find the missing elves, but the problem is that it's still fairly active even after nightfall and they'll need to wait until late at night once there are fewer people around. Since they wouldn't act immediately, Ark takes his bag and tells them that he'll be gone for an hour as he has some errands to attend to. Danka tells Ariane that he's surprised that she would rely on an outsider, and she tells him that if not for Ark's help, 
she'll have been captured. She knows she failed as a warrior as her sister, even would have managed and most likely won without much difficulty. He tells her that for how young she is, she has acquitted herself admirably, and with experience, she'll one day stand as an equal. Danka asks her if they can trust Ark and she affirms that they can. Ark makes some money from the things he got off the bandits earlier and uses it to treat himself to Goa beef skewers, the same meal that Danka and Ariani were eating, and others like the seasonal fruit pizza, salt-grilled rainbow sword trout, and the Diento specialty honey beer. Some other elves have been taken into captivity again by bandits. The bandits plan on taking the girls out first thing the next morning. One of the girls walks up to the bandits and tells them that she knows one of their warriors will save them and kill the bandits. They laugh at her and drag her by her hair. The other girls are optimistic that someone will come and rescue them. It's nighttime, and Ark, Danka, and Ariane prepare to launch their mission, but unknown to them, someone is watching their movements. They get to the front of the building, and there is no shortage of guards, even at the rear entrance. Ariane concludes that once the elves are free, any enemies they encounter will die. She asks Ark if he'll be able to teleport them to a window on top of the building, and Ark says there should be no problem with that. She suggests that they move further behind so that the light from the magic circle wouldn't alert the guards, but he tells them that there should be no concern at all there. He tells them to place his hands on him, and he uses the dimension move to take them to the window. When they witness this, even Danka said it was impressive. While Ariani struggles to fit herself through the small window, Ark uses dimension move to get himself and Danka in. They move around the house and in one of the rooms, they meet some bandits killed in their sleep by a single strike in their throat for each of them. The blood is still fresh, meaning it was recently carried out. They split up so they can continue to carry out their search for the children, and Danka tells them to be careful. Ark uses dimension move to make the sound of his footfalls a non-issue. One of the rooms that Ark tries to enter is locked, and he uses dimension move to enter the room and meets dead bandits again. He wonders who could be doing all of this, and immediately, the girl watching them earlier begins to attack him. He calls her a furry-eared ninja, and she asks him how he knows what a ninja is. She knows he's not an ordinary intruder, and she doubts he could be acting maliciously since he's in the company of a spiritual creature. She asks him if he's there to free the captive elves, and he asks if that's what she's after. She tells him that she couldn't find what she was looking for and gives him directions to the imprisoned elves. She tells him that two elves are being held captive at the Lord's Manor as well, and she takes her leave. He opens the documents that were handed over to him by the ninja girl, and it's the contract documents for purchasing elf slaves that have the name of Lord of Diento written on it. Other bandits come in to attack them and announce to the others that they have intruders. The three of them are left with no other choice but to fight their way from here on. Ariani clothes her sword with fire and uses it to attack the bandits, paving the way for the others to move forward. They get to the basement where the girls are being held, defeating all the bandits and guards that stood in their way, and they successfully freed the girls. Ark uses Gate to teleport all of them out of there back to the top of the mountain, far away from where the girls were held captive. He notices the mana eater collar on the girls' necks and uses uncursed magic to free them from it. Danka is surprised that Ark can break such a ceiling curse with ease, and he wonders just who Ark is. The girls thank Ark for helping them, and Danka walks up to Ariani and tells her that it isn't over. He tells her that the rest is up to his hands, and he'll make sure the girls are safe. He tells Ark to look after Ariane. Ark and Ariane take their leave for the Lord's Palace using Dimension Move. The remaining two elves are held in the Lord's Palace, about to get violated. One of the elves tells the man to get it over with if he's going to do it, and she calls him a flea-dicked bastard. Udolan, who is the son of Triton Dudiento, had accompanied the elf hunters and failed. Udolan's hand is already broken, and his dad asks him if he knows how to handle the elves. He tells him to pay attention while he shows him. The hands of the elves have been tied. Ark and Ariane use dimension move to make their way to the Lord's Palace. Ariane tells Ark to let them make their way inside from the bell tower, as the Lord's chambers are bound to be higher in the palace. Immediately they land. They are discovered by guards, and Ark uses Wyvern Slash to cut the bell drawing a lot of attention towards the top of the building while they make their way down. Triton continues to have his way with the girls until a guard knocks on his door to tell him that they have been breached by intruders. He asks 
why they haven't dealt with it, and they tell him that they are monsters. Ark and Ariani break down the door to the room and they walk in. Immediately, Udalan sees them. He breaks down and begins to scream that it's them. Triton tries to attack them, and Ariani kicks him down below. She runs towards the girls and tells them to rest easy. Udalan tries to run away, and Ark uses Dimension Move to appear at his front and tells him that he's not going anywhere. Ark slams his head on the wall and breaks the wall in the process. He notices a hidden room and calls Ariani to come and check it out. Triton tells them not to think they would get away with what they have done. He tells them that he is a Rodin Kingdom Marquis, and Ariani continues to hit him. Ark asks her if she isn't taking things too far, and she tells him that they broke the treaty first, and she hardly sees a problem with exacting a price for that. She tells the two elves that they can do anything they want with him, and tells them to get satisfaction, and the girls beat Triton up. Guards walk in, and Ark tells Ariani to keep the guards occupied, as he has matters to attend to in the hidden room. She defeats the guards and tells the girls that they need to escape and meet up with Danka so they can head for Lalatoya. Ark is busy packing up gold bars in the hidden room. Ariani tells him that she is finished up and she asks him what he's doing. He tells her that she'll be surprised how much money is necessary to rebuild an organization. He tells her that if they try to re-establish their abduction syndicate, they could be deprived of their funds. Explosion suddenly begins to occur at different parts of the building, and the both of them decide to make themselves scarce by using Gate to teleport themselves away from the castle with a huge amount of gold. Ark tells her that he assumes he has fulfilled his contract, and she thanks him. She hands him a small bag of gold and asks if it's a sufficient reward, and he accepts it. She asks him what he plans on doing now, and he tells her that he doesn't have anything particular in mind. She asks if he would like to visit the elf lands with her, and she tells him that many of her kin are still being held captive, and she'll like it if he continues helping her. Ark really wishes to go, but he asks her if they would be willing to accept an outsider like him. She tells him that they'll have to meet with the Elder and get his permission. Ark tells her that he can never remove his armor, and she tells him that he would have to at least show his face when he's meeting with the Elder. She asks him if there is any reason for this, and he tells her that there is a chance that she turns her sword against him the moment he removes his helmet. She asks if he would show her his face if she swears not to turn her sword against him, and he removes his helmet. Ariani is shocked when she sees this, and she asks him what happened to him. He tells her that he's not sure himself as he simply just found himself in these lands, with nothing but his altered appearance. He tells her that he imagines it to be some kind of curse. He refuses to tell her that he reincarnated as a game character, because it's not something she'll believe easily. She tells him that if he was truly undead, he'd have the corruption of death, and he wouldn't be able to use healing spells or the power of light to dispel curses, and there wouldn't be any way that a spirit creature would be this attached to him. She tells him that he has lent her the strength to save her comrades, and because of this, his secret would be safe among the elves. She tells him that the elders may know to help if his appearance is a result of some curse. Ark tells her that it would be wonderful as there's nothing he wants more than to be rid of the curse that affects him. At Olav, the capital of the Rodin Kingdom, the king, Carlon Delfriet, Rodin Olav, talks about the matter of Marquis Diento. He asks if they know who was responsible. The first prince, Sect Rondal, Carlon Rodin Sadiai says, he doesn't know yet who was responsible, but there are rumors that the elves are responsible. The second prince, Dakaris Sitiai. Carlon Roden Vetran looks displeased with the answer. King Carlon asks, Sect what makes him deem the hearsay worth mentioning? And Sect tells his father that Marquis Diento violated the treaty, capturing elves and selling them to the Eastern Empire. He says that given the previous rumor, it now makes sense. The second princess, Yuriana Merol, Melissa Roden, Olav, says it cannot be, and Dakare says it sounds like baseless rumors to him. He asks Sect if he has any other proof, and Sect asks him if he's standing up for Marquis Diento. Dakaris slams the table and tells Sect not to impugn the nobility of the kingdom with mere rumors. King Carlon tells them to keep calm, and he says that Dakaris is correct. He tells them not to condemn the Marquis without sufficient cause, but the fact is that the rumors bear further investigation, and Sect smiles. He says that they should inquire into what has happened in Diento immediately. He asks Yuriarna what her take is on the matter 
and she replies that she heard the rumors as well, and that their being true would not only mean breaking their treaty with the elves, but it could raise tensions between their kingdom and the other nations. She says that they would need to ascertain the truth quickly and arrange to speak with the elves. Yuriana says that if the elves were to seek retribution by halting their arrangements with Limbolt, they would be held responsible by the other countries. King Carlon says that the magical equipment would be bad enough, but if they were to withhold the rune stones needed for crop cultivation, they'd be courting uprisings from their nobility as well. He asked Yuriana to head to Limbolt and make arrangements so that they might speak to the elves. Ark and Ariani are walking down the woods, and they hardly seem to be making any headway. Up ahead of them, there is better visibility. Ark uses Dimension Move to go up ahead and check it out. Ahead then is a stream where they were able to fetch water, and even Ark was able to catch a fish. At night, Ariani tells the Whispering Fowl to head back to Danka. Ariani tells Ark that Danka and the girls they rescued are safely on their way to Lalatoya. Ark asks Ariani if they are still far away from Lalatoya. She tells him that it's not far, and that in another two nights, they should be there. At Olav, Yuriana is served tea by her maid, Ferna. Ferna asks her if something is bothering her. Yuriana tells her that she's certain that her brother Dakares is involved in the elf trade and sect wouldn't stay quiet about it for long. Ferna says with joy that once Dakaris gets cast down, the throne will eventually be hers or sects. Yuriana cautions her and tells her that she shouldn't speak so carelessly, and instead, they should focus on the matter at hand, which is the diplomatic mission to Limbult. The Grand Duchy of Limbult is the only domain that has trade relations with the elves. She tells them that they must arrange for a meeting with the elves and prevent any potential conflict from escalating. Ferna says it would be wonderful to see Yuriana's sister, Seriana, who married into the Limbwilt family after a long time. Ark and Ariani get to the elf settlement of Lalatoya. Ark and Ariani get to the elf settlement of Lalatoya. Ariani introduces herself and requests that they allow her access. She tells Ark to wait for her there so she can get permission from the Elder. The location is huge and old, and has probably been there for ages long past. After a long time of Ark waiting, Ariani comes and tells him she has gotten permission from the Elder, and he comes in. Ark is amazed when he enters the Elf settlement, he asks about a huge tree, and Ariani tells him that the Elder lives there. He meets with Dylan Targ Lalatoya, the Elder of the village, and his wife, Glenis, who is Arya's mother. Ark introduces himself as a traveling mercenary. It immediately strikes the mind of Ark that the two of them are Ariani's parents. Glenis says she is currently 170 years old, and Ariani tells Ark that she's 245. Dillian says that Ariani has informed him of the general picture, and he expresses his gratitude on behalf of all elves. He says that it was unexpected to hear that she would attack a feudal lord's palace, and Ariani tells him that they were the ones who broke the treaty. Ark elaborates on the situation and makes Dillian understand that they were rescuing girls who had been captured by Diento's lords. Dillian says he understands how it came to pass, but he has to explain what has happened at the general meeting of the elders. Ariani offers to follow him to the meeting, and Dillian is in support of this. He says he's traveling to Maple the next day, and the trafficking contract needs to be brought to their attention as well. Glenis serves them dinner, and Ariani tells Ark that he can relax. Dillian tells him that he heard of his condition, and he doesn't need to worry about Glenis and him. The next day, when Ark wakes up, he meets Glenis cleaning the house, and she asks if he had a good night's rest. He asks her if Delane and Ariani have already left, and she tells him that they just left. She tells him to wait while she serves him breakfast. Dillian and Ariani are on their way, and they go to use the transport circle to Maple, which has already been prepared ahead for them. They appear at the forest capital of Maple and walk down immediately towards the place where the general meeting of the elders is held. The chief elder, Brian Boyd Evangeline. Maple tells Dillian that he believes he's there to report on the investigation into the kidnapping. Glenis takes Ark around the settlement, and she tells him that for security, they absorbed a few of the smaller settlements that used to be in this area, making them number around 4,000. The other elves wonder silently what a human is doing in their settlement, some even saying they have never seen such armor before. The girls he saved at first recognize him, and they walk up to greet him with joy and happiness on their faces. The matter at the Lord's Palace can only be described as careless, as breaking a 400-year treaty is as much justification for war as there has ever been. The lands split into two during the war 600 years ago, 
This only happened a generation ago for the Elvers but is a matter of history for the humans as there are none of them alive who still remember. They suggest sending a notice explaining the situation to the Roden Kingdom, one which the Great Elder, Fangus Flan Maple, goes against when he says that they are under no obligation to justify themselves to the Roden Kingdom and reveal the details of the mission to those who would be executing it would be at risk of being summoned by the nation in question. He tells them not to show weakness. Brian says the humans were at fault for breaking the treaty, but he sees attacking a lord's home as being excessive as it could spark another war. He says that the operation to liberate their kindred would continue while they carefully watch the reaction of Rodan's kingdom. Ark spars with Glenys in an open field. She tells him that she was the one who taught Ariane how to use a sword and she should be up to the task. She tells him that as her mother, she wants to know if she can rely on him. She flawlessly beats him in the first fight and Ark knows that he needs to learn the way of the sword if he's going to survive in their world. Dillian and Ariane are heading back and Ariane apologizes to her father. He tells her that there was no other way as she did it to save their kin. He tells her that she'll be continuing her search and they'll hire Ark to help her in an official capacity. He tells her that it would have been nice to see Even while they were in Maple. Ariane asks if he has business with her sister and her dad tells her that Even is getting married the next year. Even runs and hugs Ariane. She tells her that she couldn't believe that she was going home without saying hello, and she's glad she managed to catch them. Even tells Ariane that she's proud of her, and she has heard of how many of their kind that she saved. She tells Ariane that she has grown stronger, and Ariane disagrees and tells her that she still has a long way to go compared to her. Ark and Glennys continue to spar until it is nighttime when she rushes to make dinner before Dillian and Ariane arrive. Before dinner, Dillian tells them to gather around and let them discuss their agenda going forward. He tells them that at the general meeting of the elders, it was decided that they would investigate the names involved in the contract and continue freeing their kin. He asks that Ark continue to assist Ariane. He says they can't offer much in terms of payment as Ark seems to have more money than they do after all, which is why he can offer a bit of information instead information that could lead to breaking the curse on his body, he tells him that there's a spring near the Lord Crown that can break any curse. Ark asks what the Lord Crown is, and Dillian tells him that out of the several kinds of dragonkin in the world, the greatest of them are the Dragon Lords. The Lord Crown is a rare type of great tree that grows where a Dragon Lord makes its home. Some spirits dwell in the Lord Crown, which has a variety of effects on its wood and leaves, but because a Dragon Lord lives in its vicinity, anyone who disturbs the spirits would suffer for it dearly. Ark asks if it's possible to enter the domain of the Dragon Lord and survive, and Ariane tells him that it would be dangerous for a human, but if an elf should arrange for it, they should get permission to enter. Ark accepts this as a worthy payment to strike the deal. At night, Ark begins to wonder if he looks like this because of a curse or just an avatar from before. He tries using the uncursed skill on himself and he tries it on his right hand first and surprisingly, his hand turns back to human. The hand that has just turned to normal gets turned back to its skeleton form. Ark continues to cast the spell, but it reverts to its skeleton form after a while. The next day, Ark and Ariane walk through the Densi forest and Ark hopes he can discover if his cursey is curable or not. Ariane asks him if he's alright and he assures her that everything is fine. They go into an opening that has a pond and walk towards it. Ark sees giant insects around the pond and as soon as they notice him, the insects start to attack them. At night, Ariane asks him why he ran away from them, and she finds out that he's scared of bugs, so she uses this to make fun of him. She shows him a map and tells him that she feels that they pass through the forest rather than going around it. A bar owner hears them and advises them not to go through the forest because it is a dangerous place that has about 12 people attacked by haunted wolves. Ariane asks if the wolves have always been in the forest, but the woman tells her that the haunted wolves just recently show up in the woods. Ark sees how hasty Ariane wants to reach their destination, so he tells her to proceed and she agrees that they'll head into the forest the next day. The next day, at Olaf, a cart containing the second princess is spotted. Her maid asks her why she doesn't want to go with many guards, but Urana tells her that the more the number of escorts, the slower they are. Ark and Ariane walk through the forest and notice that they are around the place where they are told monsters appear. Ariane says that the tales of the haunted wolves give off blue light and they are considered to be the perfect gift to be given to the bride-to-be. Ark asks if she would like to obtain haunted wolves for a veil 
but she tries to talk him out of it. They sense the monsters close by, so they take their fighting stance. Ark slashes one of the wolves, but it disappears into the atmosphere, and he suspects it to be an illusion. He remembers that the wolves are a type of lupine monster that attacks in packs, known for creating multiple illusions of themselves to confuse their prey during a hunt. Ark attacks multiple of them, but it turns out that they are illusions. He sees multiple of them charging at Ariani, so he tries to warn her, but she deals with them using magic, and he gets to witness how strong she is. A lot of wolves stick onto his armor, but their fangs cannot penetrate it. He looks at the leader of the pack watching its underlings from afar, and Arcus's dimension move to teleport to it. The wolf evades his attack as soon as he tries to strike it and leaps into the air. Ark notices a magic rune on the foot of the wolf and sees that it's the same type that was on the foot of the basilisk. He uses the basilisk attack once again, and the wolf evades and attacks Ark from behind. Ark uses flame magic to hit it at point-blank range and then slashes the magic rune at its foot. The wolf notices that it has lost his rune stone so it calls his pack and they retreat into the forest. Ariani catches up to him and asks what he's been doing. She sees the magic rune on the floor and watches it dissolve into the air. Ark tells her about the magic ring and how it is similar to the one he saw on the giant basilisk that he fought. She wonders if the rings might have been the reason that more unfamiliar creatures are in the forests, but Ark cannot confirm that. Ariani asks if he can give her a moment, and he concludes that she wants to chase after the wolves for her sister's sake. The current location of the princess is not too far from where Ark and Ariani are. Ferna tells her not to worry too much and tries to raise her mood. Yuriana tells Ferna that their current mission to the Grand Duchy of Limbolt is under the king's orders and it's being carried out in secret. She suspects Dakaris to be involved in the Elvis trade and Sect on the other hand is fighting to gain the throne, making her feel uneasy about the entire situation. The cart stops abruptly and they are being attacked by the enemies. Ariani captures three of the haunted wolves and ties them to a tree upside down. Ark recalls the battle he had earlier and remembers that he has a long way to go, even though he has all the skill set. He realizes that the magic skills are useless unless he knows how to implement them well. He concludes that he'll ask Ariani for combat training whenever he's chanced. Ponta senses a presence not too far away and alerts Ariani and Ark, and she leads them to it. Yuriana and Ferna are surrounded by the enemy. The enemy opens the door and Ferna tries to defend her, but she gets defeated with a single hit. Yuriana leaps out of the cart to reach out to Ferna, but she gets stabbed from behind in the process and she falls unconsciously to the ground. A hooded person congratulates them and tells them to make the job look like it was done by bandits. Another person approaches him and hands him Yuriana's necklace. Ponta jumps on one of the enemy's faces and tries to fight him, but the enemy holds her down and tries to kill her. Ark stops the man and throws him off. He bends down and assesses the situation. He thinks about using the resurrection skill on the princess and her maid. The enemies fire multiple attacks at him, but they end up being ineffective. They get hunted down by the wolves, and Ark joins the wolves to take them down. The wolves leave him as soon as they are finished, and Ark goes to check on the girls. Ark uses regeneration magic a spell that revives people with their vitalities fully restored. This skill wouldn't work if the damage dealt to the victim is too severe or if too much time has passed since the death of the person. Ark revives the princess and tells Ponta to keep an eye on her while he restores the others. Ark tries it on all the victims present and he notes that some can't come back because the damage done to them is too severe. When they wake up, Ferna briefs Yuriana about what happened. She tells her that it seems that they've been brought back to life and wonders what truly happened. Yuriana gathers her soldiers and addresses them, encourages them, and tells them to take her to Limbalt. Ark watches them from the shadows and doesn't expect her to be a royal. He feels like he has done something historically significant. He walks back to meet Ariane. She asks him what happened, Ed, but he doesn't give the full details about what happened. Ariane has already harvested the tails of the fox that she will use as his veil, and they continue their journey to the royal capital, Olav. Olav is a capital brimming with life. Ark sees some men try to fight a girl and tries to assist, but he gets stopped by Ariane. The girl walks up to Ark, which makes him nervous. He realizes that she's the ninja from before. The ninja girl introduces herself as a traveler trying to recover her beast people who have been captured by humans. In one of those towns, she came across a strange person 
who smelled different from other creatures she had come across and with a strange presence. She recalled him as someone who had a spirit creature tagged along with him, which meant that he didn't have malicious intent and now that she has run into him again, she feels that their meeting is fortunate. The cat-eared ninja girl congratulates him on rescuing the elves and says that she'd like to discuss things with him but not at their current location. Ariani asks Ark who the girl standing in front of him is, and he explains that she was the one who gave him the information about the locations of the elf. Although he doesn't know her name, the ninja apologizes and introduces herself as Chiyome, one of the Jinshin clan's six ninjas. Chiyome takes them to a different venue where they can discuss. Ark introduces himself as a traveling mercenary, and he introduces Ponta and Ariani to Chiyome. Chiyome goes straight to the point and asks why Ark referred to her as a ninja the other day. He tells her that in his homeland, People dressed like her are usually referred to as ninjas. She tells him that the term is only known amongst her clan and kept secret. She concludes that he comes from the same country as her great founder, and this intrigues Ark. Ark asks her if her great founder is still alive, but she tells him it was around 600 years ago, making the founder a legend at this point. Ark suspects that maybe her leader was a Japanese person too that got reincarnated into their world 600 years ago. Ariane asks Chiyome what she'd like to discuss with Ark, but Chiyome hesitates. Ark remembers that back in Diento, she was taking a big risk on her own while looking for something. He concludes that it wasn't the elves that were of concern. Chiyome summons up courage and tells Ark that she'll need his help in freeing her comrades, confirming his suspicion. Ark knows that beast people are treated badly in this world, and it's not too far apart to conclude that her people too are one of the people that have been maltreated. Chiomi says that she believes that the two of them are searching for individuals listed on the contract and she can offer them info on their whereabouts as payment for them helping her. Ark tells her that he is currently contracted to aid Ariani and her people. He asks Ariani if she is willing to allow him to assist her. Chiome also has been trying to save her people since she was little and Irene sees that they are in a similar situation, so she agrees. She says she will be joining Ark in helping him save her people. Prince Dakares complains about the wolves failing to listen to his command at the last moment. His assistant asks him if someone destroyed the rings. He concludes that Uirana is alive and is probably taking a different route. His informer tells him that since the incident in Diento, the beast people have been more active in undermining their slave business. He asks the informer if he thinks that the elves are after his life but the informer cannot confirm, so he orders the informer to do something about it. He says he'll go into hiding and leave for his safe house. Ark asks Chiomi if her great founder was a beast man like her and she replies that he was a human. She says he's a spy who took beast people into his care and taught them the ways of the ninja. This makes Ark to conclude that her founder was Japanese. When they arrive at the largest slave market in the capital, Etzat Market, she tells them that they are going to attack the place. Inside the building, some slave traders ask about the values of their products. Another replies that business has been harder for them recently, but Prince Dakares will be pleased. Chiome asks them to strike conspicuously and make a quick call to exit. Ariani doesn't understand, but she tells them that it'll buy a few of the slaves time to be able to escape. Ark realizes that Eztat is just a decoy, and many other slave markets in the capital will be destroyed simultaneously. She knows that not everybody can be saved, and she is ready to sacrifice ten to save hundreds of slaves. Ark and Ariani agree to stay with her until the end. He tells Chiyomi about his ability to use teleportation magic, and it surprises her. She says her great founder could wield such techniques also. Chiyome concludes that they can save the captives in Eztat using Ark's teleportation magic. She decides to inform her comrades before they carry out their actions, and she informs them that the attack will be carried out that night, so they should be prepared. They go back to their inn and have dinner in preparation for their night attack. Ark dresses strangely and says he is doing it to act as a decoy, but Ariani hates the outfit. Chiyomi arrives with a huge person and they introduce themselves. Ark asks her if Chiomi is her actual name, but she denies it. She tells him that some names serve as ranks based on their skills as ninjas. They confirm his suspicions because he sensed that she is named after the famous Kunoichi. Goemon, the ninja beside Chiyome, walks up to Ark and challenges him in a battle of strength, and this forms an immediate base of friendship between them, making the girls dumbfounded. 
They take their positions and get ready to infiltrate Esdot. Ark and Goman act as decoys, walking in front of the guards, protecting the main gates, and then charging at the gate. This causes other guards to rush towards where the noise is and leave their assigned positions. Chiome and Ariani seize this opportunity to infiltrate Ezdat. Ark and Goman cause distraction at the front of the gate. Ark fires magic attacks at the guards and terrifies them. They request more guards to try and set formation around the intruders, but they get easily defeated. Prince Dakares is informed that Ezdat is under attack and his reaction to the news isn't a good one. The informer briefs the second prince of everything currently going on, and Dakaris orders him to send in more men. In Estat, Goman and Ark let loose on the guards. The ninjas infiltrate Estat, and the guards charge toward the front gate, granting Chiome and Ariane a chance to break in. Ponta notices a guard looking in their direction and makes a reaction, alerting the girls in the process. Chiome uses her water-style technique to attack the guards and take out a number of them. More guards come in, and Ariane uses flame magic to attack them and take them out. They charge towards the inner chambers and see lots of slaves in jail. Chiome introduces herself to them and tells them her goals. She ends up freeing the slaves. More guards come into the jail room, but Ariani takes them out easily, buying Chiomi enough time to free up all the slaves. Ark and Goman get out of the rubbles they created earlier while fighting the guards and plan on entering the prison, but they get interrupted by Chiome and Ariani. The girls tell the men that they've managed to free the slaves in the main prison and all that. Remains is the rear prison. Ark tells them to hurry up and he tells them that reinforcement from the castle will arrive soon. Goman decides to stay at the main prison to buy them time against reinforcements, while Ark and the ladies head to the rear prison. They easily deal with the guards protecting the prison and get to the underground. They free up all the slaves present, but come across a prison door with a cloth covering the bodies of prisoners. The other slaves tell them that the slaves' men dispose of prisoners who were sick in that prison room. Chiyomi grieves, but Ark tells her they should get the remaining slaves to safety. Outside the slave house, Goman fights off multiple guards by himself, and Ark gathers the beast folk in a circle and teleports them using gate to a safe distance outside the building just before it collapses. Ark leaves the slaves to the care of the ladies, and tells them that he has something to take care of. Goman holds out against the guards but gets injured by their weapons. Ark arrives just in time and thanks Goman for holding out. He tells Goman the mission is successful and all they do now is to eliminate the soldiers. Ark teleports the bodies of the slaves into a safe distance and allows Ariani to cremate them properly. The souls of the fallen beast folk leave their bodies and dance into the sky. Dakara scatters the whole of his room when he doesn't get any good report from Etzat. He tries to check the situation for himself, but he gets stabbed by his informant. He asks why his informant did that before he passes out. Sect walks in immediately Dakaris loses consciousness and thanks Cetrion, Dakaris informant. Sect uses Dakaris's slave situation to his advantage. He plans on announcing the death of Yuriana and blaming it on Dakaris. He walks away while claiming that the Rodan Kingdom belongs to him. Back in the forest, Chiyomi thanks Ark and Ariani for helping them rescue the beast folk. She tells them that the beast folks have been rescued safe and sound. Goman and Ark challenge themselves again to another strength battle and they thank each other. Ariane tries to lift Chiyomi's mood, but Chiyomi is determined to get stronger no matter what. The three of them travel by boat through the channels of the town of Olav. Chiyomi offers her thanks to them and they ask her where she plans to go next which she later divulges. She decides that it's time she provides them with the information she promised. At the Grand Duchy of Limbolt, Princess Yuriarna arrives at the castle and sees her sister waiting to welcome her. She runs into her arms and they shed tears of joy. She tells Yuriarna about how the news of her being slain by Dakaras almost broke her, and Yuriarna seems surprised, so she asks for clarity. They discuss the entirety of the situation in the mansion. She briefs Yuriarna about how she was told that Dakaris was behind everything, but he got killed by Keltrian. Once Yuriarna realizes that Dakaris is dead, she seems uneasy knowing fully well that Sect will get the throne. She asks why Dakaris was concluded to be her killer, and her sister elaborates that her beloved necklace was found with him at the place where he was killed. She suspects Sect to have planned it all. Her sister is glad that Yuriarna is alive, so she suggests telling their father, but Yuriarna is against it. 
She says that she's sure it'll come in handy somehow. She asks her sister for aid in meeting the elves for the sake of both races. Ariani sends the Whispering Fowl to Danka after learning of the complicated situation they found themselves in. Ark remembers the information Chiomi gave them earlier, how the Revlon Empire is involved with the Elvis slave trade. He remembers how serious Ariani got when she first heard the information, and he is delighted that he gets to travel internationally. Ariani hurries him up, and they leave for the Revlon Empire. At the Revlon Empire, a man reports to the Emperor about the death of Prince Dakaris and how he got killed by his brother Sect. The Emperor is not happy about it. After all, he provided for Dakaris. He asks the informant if the princess is still alive, but he tells him that she's dead. The informant says that things are going on as planned and grins. The informant informs him that the rings of the beast were destroyed every time they were called. The informant tells him that it's possible the princess got killed by another assailant. The emperor concludes that everything must all have been sect's plan. He asks the informant about a person called Fumba, and the informant tells him that the plan to bring Olaf to ruins is ongoing. In the deserted lands full of monsters and strange plants, Ark's company stares at these strange creatures and he gets excited when he learns that some of the creatures he saw fly earlier are wyverns. They try to send the whispering foul messages, but it won't fly due to the sky being filled with wyverns. Ark jumps down from a cliff and uses a lightning spell to strike them all down, including his allies. He teleports and realizes that he made a blunder. Someone watches his company from afar and notes down their findings. Ariani complains in a bar and says that she'll appreciate it if he warns her before using massive magic next time. He apologizes and they discuss the route they'll be taking. Ark notices the change in Ariani's expression and asks what the matter is. He says that he noticed her reluctance to come to this empire after the information Chiome gave them. She explains that the capture of elves isn't illegal in the empire, and it is very concerning. Since she's an elf, it'll be more dangerous than before, and she admits that she's more nervous. A stranger in glasses approaches them. He tells them that he saw them in the desert earlier that day. He introduces himself as Kasi, but before he can continue, Ariana uses a vase to cover his face. She asks him why an elf would reveal his ears in the middle of a human town. Ariani is shocked by the open conversation happening between an elf and a human, and when she sees the customers of the bar invite Kasi over for a meal, she demands an explanation. Kasi calms her down and joins their table. He tells them that it's been 10 years since he moved into this town and he says he wants a world where humans and elves can coexist together. Ariani asks him if he knows what the humans have done. Kasi agrees with her point and then reminds her that she is traveling with a human despite her resentment. She tells him that Ark is a special case and Ark asks him what he's here to tell them. Kasi tells them that he makes a living from studying plants and he's been struggling to find some specimens so he'll need their aid. Ariani denies his request, telling him that they have more pressing matters to attend to. Kasi hands them the map of the Holy Region Empire and they are surprised that he has what they need. They suspect him of eavesdropping, but he asks them if they need it. Ark asks Ariani for permission and she agrees. He tells them that they'll set out the next day. Ariani seems skeptical about Kasi, but doesn't say a thing. Ark and Ariani lodge at an inn, and Ariani thinks about the coexistence between elves and humans, and seems a little worried about that possibility. They both drink through the night, and Ariani gets drunk and pounces on Ark, turning the room upside down due to the effect of the drink. The next day, Ariani wakes up and sees a skeleton on the floor. She tries attacking it, despite Ark reminding her that he is the one. She asks Ark if nothing happened, and he doesn't give her any reply. Later in the day, they meet up with Kasi in the desert. Kasi tells them that the two of them made a ruckus the entire night, and the town heard them. Ariani is upset by that kind of statement coming out of Kasi's mouth, so she unsheets her sword. While they travel, Ark notices Ariani looking bad as a result of her motion sickness coupled with the hangover from the previous night. He notes that the stench from the goblin carcasses also worsened her case. Kasi says the dead goblins will serve as bait for the sandworms, which is what he has been trying to capture. One of the riders gives Ark a tea that works against hangover and motion sickness. Ariani Ariani appears to be nervous around humans, but Kasi tries to talk her out of it. Ark offers Ariani the tea, and she takes it and is surprised at how good the tea is. Ark asks Kasi for the specific worm he is tracking, and Kasi gets into the details. He says, the worm is weak to flame, and it likes to come out at night to feed in corpses. He says that the reason he is studying these monsters is to find a way to prevent them 
from causing casualties in the future. Ark praises him and tells him that he'd love to hear more about the monsters Carsey has studied. Ariani looks out of the wagon and notices that the other wagons are gone, so she alerts them immediately. A giant sandworm comes out of the ground and tries to attack the crashed wagon not too far away from them, and Ariani jumps out to attack the sandworm with flame magic, but it proves useless. The monster changes its target to Ariani and strikes at her, but Ark saves her just in time and stops the monster just before it bites her. He tells her to rescue their ally while he buys her time, and as soon as she does that, she informs him. Ark lets loose by carrying the sandworm and smacking it on the ground, which surprises all of them. Carsey thanks him and hands him the map to the Empire. Ariane asks Carsey why he lives among humans and he tells them that it's because he loves them. Ariane doesn't expect such a reply, so she asks him why. He tells her that his time with the elves gave him a bad impression of humans, but ever since he started leaving with them, he realizes that they aren't so different after all. He concludes that he wishes for a time when elves and humans can live hand in hand. She tells him that she cannot imagine a future like that, and it surprises him because she hasn't heard the latest news about Lambert. He tells them that the Lord of Lambert took an elf as his bride, and she freaks out. She wonders if the elf was coerced into marrying a human, but he explains to her that the feeling is mutual. Ark and Ariani leave for their destination, and Ariani wonders if it truly is possible for humans and elves to coexist. Ark tells her that someday it'll be possible, and he reminds her that he's a human and she's an elf. She tells him that he hardly looks like a human, so he doesn't count. A man with a tattoo is addressed by another man. The man blames him for causing the disappearance of people, and gets angry at him for using their secret base to host girls. The man asks him about their plans, and the man with a tattooed face tells him to walk with him. He shows him a huge crater full of monsters, and pushes one of the girls into the hole, causing the girl to be eaten by the monsters. Ark and Ariane arrive at the border of Kayeshk, signifying that they've entered the Holy Revlon Empire. They notice how tight the town's border is, and think about what the next step they would take is. They decide to split up and search for elves around the town, asking around for information regarding elves. When the sun sets, while Ark is feeding Pota, he remembers the information he gathered from the townsfolk. He says, strange cries have been heard from a fortress in the east late at night, and monsters have been appearing on the borders of the Empire's territory and causing people to go missing. He is surprised that Kayeshk is less secure than it looks. He complains about not getting information about elves, he plans to meet up with Ariane, but he hears a cry not too far away, and he goes there to check it out. He sees a lady being harassed by some bandits, so he goes in to rescue her. She hugs him and thanks him for saving her. Ariane walks in and misinterprets the situation, but Ark tells her to calm down while he explains to her what happened. She scolds him for always butting his head into every problem he sees. Ariane sends the girl home after finding out that the girl isn't hurt. Ariane looks angry because of what had occurred earlier, so she walks off ahead of him. At the fortress in the east, the tattooed man questions the men Ark disciplined earlier for letting the lady get away, but the men play the blame game passing the blame between each other. The tattooed man called Fumba leaves them to be eaten by one of his monsters. He walks to inspect his monsters in the huge hall and promises to offer them food. Ariane explains to Ark as they stand not too far away from the fortress. She tells him about the elves that were brought to the fortress a few months ago. Ark concludes that it's likely that the elves aren't there anymore, and Ariane agrees but she suggests that they still check the place out so they both go there. They infiltrate the fortress but they are not able to find anyone around. They search around and come across a secret passage that leads underground. They sense beasts below them and still decide to go that way. Ponta is used as bait to lower the guards' attention and they take out the guards in the process. They get behind the door and the stench of beasts intensifies. They go beyond that place and see a strangely built underground passage. Fumba comes out complaining and sees the two of them. As soon as Fumba calls Ariani his, she starts to attack Ark. Fumba sees that Ariani is a dark elf and grins to himself for hitting a jackpot. He commands her to kill Ark and Ark tries to use uncursed magic to get rid of the spell on her, but it fails. Ariani finds herself being stared down at by her sister. Devon calls her weak and says they need to train for her to get stronger. She commands her to show her how strong she is, but in reality, she's fighting Ark. He continues to use the uncursed spell, but it doesn't work, and she continues to fight him. He comments that he feels like his spell works, but something is stopping it. He studies Ariane as she attacks him, 
and sees a glimpse of a monster in her hoodie, Ponta jumps in and brings out the mini creature, giving Ark the chance to burn off the creature. Ark notes that the creature is an imp. The thing kept casting illusions while clinging onto Ariani. Fumba introduces himself to them as Rosombanya, a monster sorcerer. He tells Ark that he can make monsters do as he pleases, and Ark suspects him of being the person behind the monsters attacking the forests he was at. He asks Fumba, what happened to the elves that were brought to this fortress four months ago? But Fumba nonchalantly answers that most of them have been rid of. He goes into details about how he brutally treated them, and Ark gets extremely upset, so he slashes the giant creature's head behind Fumba with a single swing and yells at him. Fumba summons a lot of creatures to fight Ark. He sees a lot of tougher creatures than he has ever fought so far, but he goes berserk on them and kills each with a single stroke. Fumba keeps summoning more monsters, but Ark keeps killing them. A monster gets close to Ariane and tries to kill her off while she's unconscious, but Chiyome steps in to stop him. Fumba tries to call out his monsters, but she tells him that it is futile, as most of his monsters have already been dealt with. Ark asks what Chiyome is doing here, but she is surprised that Ariane didn't tell him anything about her plans. He concludes that she was the one Ariane got the intel from about this fortress. The entire fortress starts shaking and Fumba smiles now that his masterpiece has woken up. He runs off leaving them to fight his monster but Ark teleports out of the fortress just before it collapses. The monster breaks forth from the fortress and Ark notes it to be a top tier monster with a mastery over the highest class of water magic, a hydra. An explosion occurs on the rock beneath the castle and Ark while he's holding Ariane in his arms with Chiyome and Ponta on both sides of his shoulder teleports into the air. He looks at the site of the explosion covered in smoke and dust and discovers a hydra. Ark introduces, he starts to give a summary of his mission and how he has to fight the abomination, which is the Hydra. Ark appears, far away from the Hydra, and drops Chiyome and Ariane. Chiyome starts to talk about the Hydra being the infamous ruiner of nations and asks if the man from before is the one controlling it. Ark tells her he is. Chiyome continues to talk about how humans can control a beast of such scale. Ark notices five rings on the chest of the Hydra. She tells Ark that they need to prepare before engaging it, and suggests that they retreat. One of the Hydra's heads notices them. It shoots fire at them from his mouth. Ark tries to cover Ariane who is unconscious while Chiyomi tries to escape. Fumba stops controlling the Hydra and starts laughing out loud, asking how the taste of his power is, while saying he wiped them out. At his village, Fumba asks the elders why they won't give him the credit he is due. He tells them that no one in the clan compares to him. One of the elders tells him that he's weak and that in his weakness, he is searching for superficial strength, telling him that they won't approve of him. The Hydra walks around while Fumba admires its powers. He says that he will be unstoppable with its power and that he will make everyone that looked down on him bow to him. He sends the Hydra toward a town to consume the town. Ark was able to activate his shield in time, saving him from the crumbles. Chiyomi tells Ark that he could not even block such an attack and Ark laughs. He says that he is just a mercenary following Lady Ariane and he starts looking for Ariane. He sees her standing on a rock already conscious and she tells him she was just under a layer of illusions. She looks at Ark and tells him that they should go and find Fumba so she can make him regret the things he did to the kids. Ariane and Chiyome start to think about what plan they can use and when they move to initiate their plans, Ariane tells Ark to follow him. She notices that he is staring at the Hydra that is going towards the town, and after some discussions, he tells them that he can kill it. Ariane calls Chiyome to follow her to search for her enemy. She tells Ark to take care of the Hydra before she leaves. At the palace, the noble comes to give the Holy Emperor his update. He tells the Emperor about the Hydra project and that it's ready for fielding. The Emperor smiles while he asks the noble what he should do for Fumba with a creepy smile on his face. The Hydra continues to move toward the town and the gatekeepers ring the bell signaling to the soldiers. The commander starts to instruct the soldiers on what to do and where to evacuate the citizens as he gathers his soldiers that will defend the land that was entrusted to them by the Emperor. One of the Hydra's heads tries to shoot a breath attack but is interrupted by Ark's wyvern slash. The other head attack him but continue unleashing his attacks on the Hydra. He uses his combat skill to cut off the head of the Hydra, but it immediately starts to regenerate. He acknowledges it being a mythological beast before retreating to cast a spell. He summons Ifrit, the Inferno Demon, to confront the Hydra, whose heads just regenerated. 
Ifrit stands in front of it while Ark declares to the Hydra that he won't let it continue. Ariani, Chiomi, and Ponta run through the forest looking for Fumba. They notice Ark's summoning Ifrit. Ponta notices something and runs towards the area while the other two run after it and call for it. Fumba is pissed and as he's getting ready to give the Hydra a command, he gets interrupted by Ariana who shoots a fireball at him which he dodges. He sees her and starts to talk to her like an ex-lover, asking if she came for more. She tells him that she came to kill him and this makes him laugh. Ariani affirms the power of the Hydra, but starts to talk down on him, telling him that he is weak and this makes Fumba remember when one of the elders in his village told him that he is weak. He angrily attacks her but she nullifies all his attacks and when he finds himself in a tight spot, he tries to command the Hydra, but he gets stopped by Chiyome, who attacks him from behind and damages the curse mark he is using to command the Hydra. Fumba laughs at them, and he tells them that the Hydra is now beyond his control, and it will eat everyone in the town it is heading towards. She tells him that Ark will stop it while she destroys all his means of fighting back before she sets him on fire to kill him. Ifrit launches the first attack on the Hydra with a punch on one of its heads, Ifrit punches it on the chest, which throws it backward. Ark teleports to where the Hydra is, grabs its tail, and starts to rotate it around. After a while, he throws into the air and activates Ifrit's skill, Flame Hellion. Ifrit releases a massive breath attack that completely eradicates the Hydra, while Ariani and Chiyome watch the occurrence from where they are. The sun starts to rise and Ark runs towards them, asking if they are okay. He asks Ariani if she settled things on her end, which she tells him that she has. She asks Ark what Ifrit is, and he tells her that he summoned the creature from another dimension and it would return very soon. A whispering foul from Danka lands on Ariani's hand and delivers a message to Ariani that Rodan's second princess, Yuriana, is meeting with Lord Fungus who is one of the great elven elders, and Ariana is surprised. At the Rodan royal castle, Yuriana proposes an offer to the elves that the Rodan kingdom will take the responsibility of searching for their missing kin. She swears by the honor of Rodan's royal family that they will atone for the crime of men, which is breaking the long-term pact with the elves and prosecuting them. Fangas asks her about what else she wants since he doesn't believe that their deal is done and she talks about her siblings backing which makes Fangas believe that she wants the elves to back her for the succession of the throne. She convinces him that Rhodes will support them while telling him that the Lord of Lambert took an elf wife, making her emphasis on the human and elven coexistence. She stretches her hand to shake Fangus who agrees and takes her hand. Ark and the others walk on a path journeying back to the city and Ark tries to brighten Ariani's mood for the loss of her job. At Sex Castle, one of the prince's subordinates informs him that his sister Yuriana is still alive. He tells the prince that her negotiation with the elves was successful and that she is on the verge of winning the the people's favor. The prince starts to think about the failed assassination, thinking that one of his subordinates is on his sister's side. In Yuriana's room, she lies down on her bed thinking about when she got stabbed and died. She thinks about her being alive as a chance to accomplish something in the world, and she tells herself that she will face it without any hesitation. At the emperor's throne room, one of his noble subordinates tells him that the Hydra and Fumba have died, and he says that is not a problem while talking about the employ ring's usefulness and about his interest in the person who slew the great beast. While the conversation is going on with Ark and his team, Ark removes his helmet, and as Chiyome sees his skeleton head, she screams and runs to hide behind a tree, while Ariani tells her it is probably a type of curse. Ark asks Ariani what she will do when she gets back to Lalatoya, and she tells him that she will take him to Lord Crown so that he can get into the spring that can break curses. Ark tells Chiyomi that he would love to visit her ninja village. Ark's journey started with his goal of living a quiet life, but with the new friends he has made, he puts aside all other things and decides to just enjoy his adventure a bit longer. 